Welcome to the Socket Podcast. On this week's episode, we welcome Meg Daly, a new friend of mine um, that I was connected to from a a business colleague. Um, He reached out to me and I think out to Meg and said, we really think that you guys would be a great two people to connect. And um, like I said, with a woman that we had on our podcast earlier, Tish, we, uh, Meg and I connected over a Zoom call because we're kind of in the middle of of the COVID issue right now. And uh, we could have just kept talking for a really long time. So I figured she would be a wonderful person to bring on the podcast today. So welcome, Meg. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. This is fun. So um, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and also tell them where you're at right now? Because I'm super jealous. I know. Yes. I love the background. Um, so a little bit about myself. Okay. I'll get that over with really quick. I am uh, I'm a coach. I'm a life coach. Um, I'm a certified life coach. I work with individuals. I also do some fun work with companies on raising the culture. And um, I'm also the founder of a program called Sober Tranquility. And where I'm at right now is Tranquility Island, I've named it. So I was presented with a beautiful opportunity this summer. Uh, Friends of mine who can't make it from out east to northern Wisconsin to their beautiful little uh, island here, they've... um, I'm staying here for a few months and working from here, and it is just a joy. It's a former uh, boys camp from the early 1900s, and this was Senior Island. So the senior boys got to stay in the cabins here, and there's actually an old, you can't see it, but there's an old cabin that's probably 70 years old that um, has like names of all these boys from over the years, and there's just, it's really a special place. So yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's awesome. I've, I've obviously seen online on Facebook that you're there and I thought, oh, that looks so lovely. <laughs> Very grateful. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's like, talk, nice to have work talk. that you can do from anywhere, right? I, I know you travel a little bit for work, but, um, but for the most part, you know, if you can be plugged into Wi-Fi and have a computer, you can uh, get what you need to get done. Absolutely. <laughs> well, what we are going to talk about today is alcohol. Um, alcohol is a super complicated issue for a lot of people, and a lot of people have very complicated relationships with it. Um, and part of socket is the tenant that there are some things in our life that we need to toss. There are some things that we'd like to recycle. And there's some things that we'd like to elevate and make stronger in our lives. And um, what I really love about Meg and her program that she offers is that she talks about ways that maybe we need to toss alcohol or maybe we need to recycle. And you call it um, releasing, reducing, or resetting. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this? What, what, how, where did you find your relationship with alcohol? If that led you to the work you're doing? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, Kathy. So uh, let's see, let's back it up a bit. <clears throat> I never was a drinker. So in high school, all my girlfriends were drinking and getting suspended for drinking. And I was the one who was <laughs> driving them around. And it, it, I just, I just, I didn't have a desire to drink. When I went off to college, I started getting a lot of anxiety. And I mm. think life changes, a lot of people, you hear about that, and anxiety is rampant in my family. So I, looking back, I started to mask. I, found, I, I discovered that, oh, if I drink, then it masks the anxiety. And so it just, I started to drink a lot in college, which a lot of kids do. Sure. And yet, yeah, and, and, and alcohol, and then I discovered wine. I was really cool. I remember seeing it, Jennifer Aniston on a friend's episode, and she came home from work, and she was exhausted, and she opened that bottle of wine. So like when I got my first job, and I was in my 20s, I'd go get the wine, and I felt very elegant and chic drinking that <laughs> Like, I am wine. so like Jennifer Aniston. That's who <laughs> I am. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm so Rachel. I even had the haircut. So... Um, <laughs> And so it just, it just became a big part of my life. And over the years, it started 10 years ago. And I, I started a, um, a cleanse, Kathy Freston, Quantum Wellness. She wrote a book called Quantum Wellness. And in that was a cleanse where you give up the big five, like gluten and sugar and caffeine and alcohol was one of them and animal okay. products. <clears throat> and it was a three week program. And by week 
two, my girlfriend and I, actually there's a group of us that did it, but only two of us hung, hung in there. <laughs> and um, I remember we were at a party and everyone was drinking wine and having a blast. And we were drinking club soda and we were effervescent. We felt amazing. And I remember grabbing her and I, and I said, I'm never going back. I'm never going back. And so while I stayed with the vegetarian <laughs> lifestyle, I crept back into alcohol and I forgot how good it felt. And so flash forward over the past 10 years, I've tried different cleanses and I've, you know, I've had to grit my teeth and bear it. And I, you know, counting the days and getting through it. And then I get through it. I'd be like, woohoo, I can, you know, ha you know, have my date with Mr. P, which is Pinot Noir. Like that's my thing <laughs> is my nightly date with Mr. P. And so what I started to realize, and this all happened organically, is that I, I had some signs come at me. A client started talking about wanting to reuse alcohol. A good friend called me and said, let's go on a 90 day cleanse. I was mm. like, whoa. How about like, let's try 30 first. <laughs> right. and so, how about we start with nine, nine right. days? <laughs> yeah, like, how about like three days? So, um, and so I thought, okay, in one day I've had a client say to me, I really want to take a break from alcohol. And I had a dear friend say it. And I thought, okay, I, I believe in synchronicities and signs. And so uh, out of the blue, I said to my client, how about I create a program for you? It'll be good for me. And so yeah. she was my muse. She was my audience. And and so I created these daily tranquility talks. I called them daily audios. We would meet once a week on a Zoom call. And I started to realize that I just kind of took off on this kind of, as Esther Hicks would say, this flying saucer. Like I was in flow and I wasn't counting the days and I wasn't gritting my teeth. And I think the reason was, the reason this time was different is before I could never get rid of the desire for alcohol. I, I, I've never been addicted to alcohol. I can give it up, no problem. I don't have any residual effects or symptoms yeah. or detail symptoms. Um, but I, I couldn't get rid of the desire. And this time it's different because I realized that alcohol is not bad. You know, drinking is not, it's not bad. It's not wrong. It's more of just reevaluating your relationship with it. And so that's what I've been doing is reevaluating my relationship with it. And what I found is that that anxiety that I talked about, yeah, hmm, it went from a, like an eight on a regular basis down to a two. Now I'll always have some anxiety. That's the way I'm wired. But what I found is that alcohol inflamed it and fueled it. And so that's been the shift for me. So my desire might be here to mm -hmm. like have a date with Mr. P, but my desire to feel serenity and inner peace, it wins. It's been mm. winning. Yep. And then it takes that struggle of craving and, and longing for for your dates um i i certainly resonate with a lot of your story actually um i didn't drink at all in high school i mean maybe i took a sip of a peach snops thing at my parents party you know when i was 17 um and and then you know, after, after college, I, I didn't go kind of the traditional route right into college. I was going to chiropractic school. So I was at home um, doing some classes at a community college to get some of the prerequisites before I went off to Palmer in Devonport, Iowa. And um, I remember my first couple experiences with alcohol were really, really bad. Um, the first one, I was visiting a friend of mine down um, in South Carolina at college. And um, I got there and this girl handed me a fifth of vodka and it probably had, you know, a couple of inches left in the bottle of the bottom of this big bottle. And I had no relationship with alcohol. So I had no idea what that meant. Um, I didn't understand. I never understood that. Okay. There's shots in there versus a beer. And, and so I went and got three Tropicana twisters and I mixed this vodka with that. I drink things really quickly, water, anything, anything I drink a lot of, and I drink it quickly. So in 45 minutes, I finished that. And then we went off downtown to, you know, go out and listen to a band. And within a half an hour, I'm throwing up on someone's shoes and I have to be taken back to a dorm. And, and the next day I threw up again in the laundry room. And then I had to fly home the next day and they bumped me to first class for some reason. And, and I, I literally threw up like three times. It was awful. You think that would have done it. You think I would have been like, you know what? Maybe alcohol, not so much for me. So it probably took a couple of years before I, um, before I started drinking again. And, um, you know, I, I just slowly weaned into it a bit. 
And when I was going through my divorce, which was 12 or 13 years ago, um, it certainly became my relief. You know, at the end of the day, a long work day. Um, and there certainly were times that I drank too much of it and didn't feel good. But uh, probably about four years ago, I got to a place where I thought, I just, I'm just uncomfortable with, I'm using this as a crutch. I can't really remember the last time I didn't have a drink at night. Um, and it kind of was like my reward, like you deserve this. You're working so hard, you're doing, everything's going so well or things are tough and you, you know, you can get some stress relief that way. And at, at some point that, that nagging feeling of, I don't know that I'm okay with this anymore. Um, it hit strong enough that I decided I was going to give it up completely. And I tried to moderate in the past and I didn't do that well, that good of a job of it. And so, but this time I really, I went for about a year and a half and I, I had no interest in drinking. Um, and, and I think I, I lost like 60 pounds. So, so alcohol and weight certainly go hand in hand for me because if I have a couple of drinks, um, my dates are with Tito. So uh, to your Mr. P, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, we won't go on a double date with them anytime, but, uh, uh, but that, that's always like, I'm like, well, I'm dating Tito a little too much, you know, and seeing I'm in a committed relationship, that's a problem. So, uh, so anyway, I, I have... I kind of go through phases where I just kind of cut it out for a while. And like you, I don't have any withdrawal symptoms. I'm not shaking. I'm not, I don't really get a headache. I, I just, I, you know, I'm not drinking enough to have those issues. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go have a couple drinks. So I, I'm just trying to navigate my own relationship, um, which is why what you're doing um, really spoke to me because I talked to countless moms in my role um, uh, in the branch moms, the community that I run, um, that struggle and that really use alcohol as a huge crutch. And I'm sure, like you said, that anxiety and alcohol, I don't, I don't necessarily understand all of the um, psychological components that connect those two, but I can see how they go hand in hand. Yes. And I loved, okay. May I share a few synchronicities of what you just said? Like, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> my first drinking scenario, let me paint a picture. Uh, <laughs> I joined a sorority, <clears throat> and I'm in my little plaid skirt from Urban Outfitters with a little blouse tied with a little Peter Pan collar, and we went to the fraternity house for pledge night. Yep. And I'm with my roommate, who's still one of my best friends, to today, Julie, and we get to the, <clears throat> we get to the front door and the guys were handing out our, each of us got our own champagne bottle. Gee, wow. I wonder why. Wow. And yeah, we, we got our own champagne bottle. And I looked at Julie and I said, we're not 21. I don't think we can, I, I, I don't, this is illegal. And she's like, are you, are you kidding me, Meg? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, whatever. And I'm drinking it. And I'm like, this feels good. And I drank some more. This was the first time that I got drunk. Mm -hmm. I drank some more. I, and Within 20 minutes, I'm up on a table, apparently dancing on my second bottle. And within another 20 minutes, she found me in the bushes, throwing up, dragged me home. And I had to get, I didn't have to get on a flight the next morning, but I had to get on a bus the next morning to go to a wedding oh. in my home. And I got off the bus and my mom looked at me and she's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what happened to you? So yeah, I mean, and and I also got divorced three years ago, or 13 years ago. And so it's really ramped up from then. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it is a Band-Aid for so many people. And I think that, you know, that feeling, I call it the hot air balloon, where when I, when I have that date with Mr. P, if I'm, it's okay, let me back it up. It's the intention behind, like, why am I, why am I going out on my date with Mr. P? Is yeah. it to escape in the hot air balloon and escape my troubles and anxiety? That's probably not such a great idea. And so it's checking your intention behind the decision to drink, checking, looking at the relationship that you have. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Cause there, you know, there's times every once in a while we went to, um, we went to our friend's house uh, last weekend or something like that. And I went and I'm like, I'm going to have a couple drinks. Like, 
I would like to have a couple of drinks. I wasn't escaping anything. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to hide from anything. I wanted to be a part of, of the party. Now I, and I can do that without drinking. I, you know, I don't, while I certainly, while it's certainly a little easier if you've had a couple of drinks sometimes to have conversations with people you don't know, um, it's, I don't, I don't need, I don't need it as a lubricant to, to be social. Um, but I wanted to, and I had a great time and went to bed early, got enough sleep and felt fine the next day. And, um, but, but like you said, when you get into those routines of every night at five o'clock or you're like counting down to five and then you're like, well, it's four fifteen. that's close enough to five. Um, and, and then that you see, you know, some, and I say moms, it doesn't have to be moms. Of course, it's anyone that's struggling with this, but um, where that time frame just keeps kind of getting earlier. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who said, man, everyone in our neighborhood in the middle of COVID was kind of going out in the driveways. We couldn't really, you know, be with, with one another, obviously, during that time, but it starts at three. And he's like, I can't start at three and drink all during the week, but it seemed like, you know, out of boredom, out of fear, out of frustration, out of anxiety for the unknown and having to sit in this super uncomfortable time of with, you know, with COVID not knowing what was going to happen or when things were going to open up or what this meant moving forward. Um, it certainly is an easy go-to to relieve that tension. It is. And, you know, you, it's interesting um, when you say like, you said earlier, I didn't know, I, I couldn't remember a night that I hadn't drank. Another similarity between the two of us is that's what prompted me to do a reset. And I always say, you know, release alcohol, you know, release, reduce, re reset. So if you want to yep. release completely, great. If you want to reduce it, great. Or if you just want to do a reset. And I stood in my kitchen and I thought, I can't tell you the last time I didn't have at least one glass. Like my go-to is yep. probably like two sometimes three. Uh, and a lot of times it was just one. Yeah. Well, it was probably more often two. <laughs> Come on. But, um, but like, seriously, you know, like I sit there and I'm like, okay, like even just for my body, I just want to, I want it, I want it. It's an experiment. And that's all it was. That's all it started with was an experiment. And mm -hmm. for me, I think it's all very relative. It's very, it's a very personal thing. You know your body best. Anyone knows their body best. And for me, when I did this reset and I just noticed that I was sleeping better and oh, that I, yeah. yeah, like I was able to show up and, and I think it's because my body was just kind of worn, <laughs> worn out from probably a couple of years, more than a year of drinking every night. Yeah, your a, body was like, what the heck are you doing to me? Like, right. Right. You know, one of the things I've used, and I, I've, I've had to use it in multiple situations in my life. When I'm dealing with something that I am struggling with or a relationship, I know, like I dated a few people after my divorce. And at the end of the day, I just knew that they weren't people that I could be in relationship for forever. Really nice men. I, you know, I have nothing bad to say about them, but when I got to the place that I knew in my gut that it wasn't the correct relationship, I had to almost extrapolate it to, because I felt guilty, right? I knew I was going to hurt someone and I hate hurting people. Um, but I would, I would push it out and think, would I want one of my children to stay in this relationship and feel the way I feel? And that has always helped me say, well, of course not. All right, well then I need to make that decision for myself. I kind of did that with drinking at one point when I, when I stopped drinking for about that year and a half. Um, I remember thinking the night that I decided, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, would I want my children to feel what I'm feeling? Because I woke up as it got a little bit worse and I've never gone back to where that was before because um, I really was struggling with it. Um, and I was just shy of it starting to affect my work, just shy of it. And I knew that and I felt it, but I was like, would I want my son, one of my sons or my, one of my best friends to be living in the space I'm living in and feeling the way, the shame I felt, the, the shame and the, um, I was so angry 
I mean, I would just wake up and just say, you're so, you're such a shitty person. How, why'd you do that again? Cause every day I'd wake up and be like, you know what, today I'm not going to drink. I'm just going to take a little break. And I just couldn't get a hold of it. Um, and so for that point in my life, I had to fully release. I knew that I couldn't moderate at all. Um, and I, it's just, it's just such a journey for so many people. And I think it's kind of, it's a, it's a tough thing to talk about with some people. Um, you look at the sensationalization. I think that's a word sensationalization. If not, I'm making it up. <laughs> we're going to use it. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go with it. Yeah, we are. Um, <laughs> but you look at the sensationalization <laughs> of, of alcohol in advertising. Um, I follow a woman named Kate B. She's out of uh, the UK um, and she, she has classes on, on dealing with alcohol and she, she talks about that pretty regularly and will show all these examples of look at how it's being advertised as empowering as, you know, bring out your feminine as um, so many different ways that, like you deserve it. You um, and, and at the end of the day, Truly, it's it's a drug, you know. It's um, it's a drug that can you know can be used appropriately, but sometimes it sometimes it just gets out of hand. Yeah, it's funny. I was I was talking with a friend the other day, and I, I said to her, um, you know, it's so uh, refreshing not to have to wake up and <laughs> run to the kitchen and look at the wine and check and be like, oh, yeah. oh, good, oh, good, oh, good. I only had, you know, when I opened the second bottle, I like a glass, like I would get obsessive about it. Yeah. And I was watching Little Fires Everywhere on um, whatever it is, Hulu, and Reese Witherspoon's character, I just about died. She's, you know, in the, in the measuring cup, that was me. And I was like, wow, I'm putting a lot of energy into planning and measuring and then like reevaluating my drinking. And, and I was saying to a friend, you know, um, the industry, the alcohol industry does really market on that. Like it's elegant, it's chic. And I'm like, you know what, in terms for me personally, nothing about how I was acting was elegant or chic. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. No, I, I, I feel that, that I, that just reminded me of a time that, um, this is probably before I had kids. Um, we went to a party and I definitely drank, I definitely drank too much and I felt horrible the next day. But even worse than the physical hangover was the fear that I'd done something really stupid or said something stupid or, um, or, you know, said something offensive, not stupid, but said something offensive or, um, and I remember calling a few people that were at the party, like, did I do anything wrong? Cause I had yeah. no memory of it. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's just not a healthy place to be in. So once I, what that, you know, that hasn't happened that often, but I've had a couple of moments or to be honest, where I've put myself in some real danger, right? I mean, you look back at the party that you went to um, that first time for you. And even for, for me, um, unfortunately, if we let our senses get that much out of control, um, the chances that something bad's going to happen is going to increase to some degree. And that's that I, I always hated sitting in that in that feeling. Um, you know, obviously there's bad people that do bad things to people. Um, but me having my my uh, my wits about me and, and knowing where I am and, and uh, being able to remember everything certainly helps situations. Yeah, I mean, I call it the damage control the next day. And I think back mm. to the fight that I had, like, you know, with my sister, you know, like you just get kind of charged up from it. It fuels it. And one of the tools that we use in Sober Tranquility a lot that um, actually it's my member's favorite tool is I call it the flash forward trick. Mm. And so if you're in the middle of a reset or if you're, you know, just reducing, you know, before you dive into the next glass of wine or even start the first glass of wine or drink, you excuse yourself, you go to the bathroom or you, you know, you just walk outside and you take literally even just 10 seconds to flash forward. Like, okay, I can have that drink if I want. It's my choice. Yep. And if I do, am I going to have another one, et cetera? So you flash forward and you say, okay, if I do that, then I have to be aware that I'm going to go to bed feeling buzzed. I'm going to wake up thirsty, maybe with a little rapid heartbeat, speaking nope. from experience, nope. um, 
mouth, waking up feeling, I call it peach fuzz brain, um, not completing all those cool things that you imagined and visualized while you were drinking, all those goals and things we were going to do. Like, I'm going to feel this way tomorrow. And so then I, then you stop and you say, okay, so as I flash forward in the future, is the next two hours of drinking worth the next 24? And then at yeah. least then, then you make an informed decision. No, for sure. How, how do you, um, I would say one of the things that I still struggle with is feeling like if I'm drinking, I'm having fun. And if I'm not drinking, I'm not having fun. And that's not actually true. It's like, is it just so ingrained in our subconscious that, oh, well, if I go to a party or I go out to dinner with my friends or I'm having a Friday or Saturday nights were always, when I wasn't drinking, it was always a little harder on those days. Like, how am I going to use up all this time? That was, an, that was another thing that really came up. The first Friday night that I wasn't drinking, I would normally go to the sushi restaurant right after work. I would get off at like 530. I'd go to the sushi, re, sushi, blah, 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 sushi restaurant and I would have a glass of wine and then, I'd, and then I'd have a meal and I'd have one more glass of wine and then I'd head home and I would drink. Uh, if I didn't have to work the next day, I, I, I could drink another bottle. I mean, uh -huh. it just, it is what it is. It's, I, I, I'm not going to lie. Right. Um, and that first Friday night, I still went to the sushi, sushi, oh my gosh, I can't say that word, sushi restaurant. <laughs> and I remember leaving at 630 and I got home and it was 645. And I thought, oh crap, what am I going to do for four and a half hours? And filling up that time became something that was liberating and a little scary all at the same time. So how do you, how do you address those two things? The, the time issue and then the concept of, I know I'm talking about two totally different issues, but the concept of drinking is fun, not drinking is not fun. Mm -hmm. So fun and time. Okay. So <clears throat> yeah. So I'm going to speak from my personal experience. I'm so with you on that because when I started this experiment, this journey, I thought, well, how am I going to have fun? I'm going to be so boring. Nothing's going to be fun. I'm not going to want to do anything because right. oh, alcohol like makes things more fun. And what I found is that <clears throat> when I do go to get togethers, which obviously are outside now, it's summertime. So I've been going to get togethers when, when not everyone drinks as much as I thought everyone did, like I did. You know, some people literally have a glass of wine. And um, so, so that's the thing about the fun. And secondly is I feel like when you remove, even if temporarily, or you reduce something from your life, when you take something out, there's the space. And mm -hmm. so again, getting intentional about what you're putting in. And another resource, I guess you could say, um, that we do in Sober Tranquility is we make a list of tranquility treats. And so whether that's, um, you know, a hot bath when you go home, um, watching your favorite Netflix, planning, you know, uh, buttered popcorn or having pancakes for dinner or, you know, just <laughs> things that like are almost like you would do as a kid, like tranquility treats, you know, booking a massage, mm. um, putting those in for some reason, it makes it easier. You look forward to it because when you're at the party, then you can choose to have fun. And by the way, for me, it was more of a ritual. And I have a plethora of ideas. If you want, I can email them to you, Kathy, of like Seed Lip is a non-alcoholic um, spirit out of England. So I have their three varieties. I make the most amazing mocktails and no one even knows. I mean, not that anyone yeah. really asks, but for me, it's been more of the ritual um, of ending the day. And so that can be fun is getting really creative with mocktails. Um, and then, you know, and, and what I find, and again, I can only speak from experience and the members in my community is that things kind of become more fun because when you have an overabundance of alcohol put into the conversation between two people, are you really present? Yeah. Or do you wake up the next morning and go, I can't even remember what he said. Did he say he loved me? I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, um, but like, you know, it's, it, it, and so, so life to me actually becomes really fun. Just yeah, uh, Sunday, I was down at the beach over here with everyone and they were day drinking. They're like, man, come on down. We're day drinking. So I came down and they had their margaritas and their rosé and they were having a blast. 
And I felt really, I had fun too. And there was absolutely no judgment. I'm like, they are having so much fun. And I was having fun. And I knew that I was going to go back up to the cottage and I was going to finish like this book that I loved. And I was going to have some like brownies. And, you know, and that's another thing, you know, you, you're, you talked about releasing weight, you know, you're able to bring some other treats in. When you talk about time, that's another thing. Time is, time for me, and I did a talk on this with the group, it, time opens up at least yes. for me, I'm, I'm hearing that time opens up. I don't have the anxiety of, I got to quick get this all done because I got to have my Pinot Noir and watch the news and have dinner and then watch a Netflix that I'm not really going to remember in the morning. Now it's like, oh, I can have dinner and I have this whole amount of time. So I feel like with work, with my personal life, with relationships, the anxiety is down because it's like, you got plenty of time. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it, it is. It, it, it's so interesting. And I, I know for me, when you brought up like massage, there, there's a little massage place right around um, the corner from my house. And you can just walk in and do like a, you know, I don't know, $30 foot massage. And in those first couple of weeks, I went a lot. And at some point I was like, man, I'm really spending a lot of money on this massage because then I give a nice tip. And, and then I'm like, yeah, but how much was I spending on alcohol? Right. And then, so I had more time and I had more money and on a health component, I lost weight. Um, I wasn't spending as much out because if I had, you know, one or two drinks out, that was $25 by the time you're done with it. Um, right. And my blood pressure, I was able, I've been able to go off my blood pressure medicine. Um, and again, some of that's weight. Yeah, you know, I'm down from where my highest was. Um, and when I get that high, then I, I just need to go on blood pressure medicine because it's not safe for me not to be. Um, and I also noticed that my heart rate goes down. And so um, someone, a colleague, um, or not necessarily a colleague, but someone I know in the, um, the community that is um, a leader in the community made a post one time that he had given up alcohol and, and also um, cleaned up his diet and was working out. And he talked about how, how much lower his resting heart rate is. And I certainly have noticed that as I take better care of myself, which I include you know, reducing alcohol with that, um, my, my resting heart rate goes down quite a bit. And so you think, you, you, you know, kind of think about that long term. And if people are just drinking too much all the time and it's increasing our blood pressure and our heart rate, what it really does to our health on a long term basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I had a therapist say to me once, um, it was, when was it? I think it was last year. She said, you know, Meg, people that are predisposed, everyone's got their stuff, high blood yeah. pressure, diabetes, you have anxiety. It runs yeah. in your family. Depression and anxiety are very prevalent in my family. And she said, for you, I bet you can go out with a friend who will have a martini and a glass of wine and feel fine and get up the next morning and go work out. But for you, it's different. I said, yeah, it is. And for some reason, and I won't get into the medical stuff, but you know, she explained that it just fuels that anxiety. And she also explained that alcohol, you know, when you overindulge, you feel like, okay, I just got to get through the next day. I'm feeling hungover. Yeah. Um, I'll feel better the following day. She said, actually, that for people with anxiety, the anxiety hits its high point three days later for some reason. Wow. There were studies done. And I was like, so what I'm doing is I'm keeping myself in a perpetual cycle. Like I'm not drinking once or twice a week, you know, giving my body a rest. I'm drinking every night. So there's no... <laughs> continuous you know no break right right yeah it's uh how um how long have you been on this journey of of releasing alcohol so i started honestly someone just asked me that this morning i have to look at my calendar i started mid-april and i committed to like i said 90 days and i think i am coming up on 90 days pretty darn soon okay. um and I think it's interesting that I can't even remember like the exact day because I've just, I've just so merged into, I'm doing, I'm, I'm feeling so good that I'm not like checking off the days, but it was like mid April and where are we at now? We're like July 7th. So it's yeah. almost three months. Yep. Um, and you know, for me, it's just been, I sleep like a baby. I released weight. Uh, I have more mental clarity. 
And for me in this time of my life, I've got some things in work that really, it needs the energy that I have. So for me at this point in my life, I need to be where I'm at. Like I need to um, give my body and my mind that break to where yeah. I can um, be in my purpose, really. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel the same thing. I, I um, have, have really made a conscious effort to be intentional about getting exercise um, almost every day. And I, I normally walk um, and I, I've been doing a little bit of running. One day I was just out on a walk and I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about challenging your body to do something that you've always told yourself you just can't do. And in my head, I'm just too heavy to run. Um, I've always been an athlete. My body responds pretty well to anything I try to have it do. It, it does it pretty well, even if I am on a, like a little heavier side. And so I decided I was going to, I was going to run for, I don't know, 200 steps. And I was like, okay, that wasn't bad. You know, and I've been walking a lot. So um, my cardiovascular system was, was doing a pretty good job. And then I, I walked a little more and then I ran a little more and I walked a little more and I ran a little more. And, and as it's come up, I now can get through my, I think the loop I do is about 2.6 miles. Um, and I can get through 75, 80% with running. I uh, running. I it's a very painfully slow jog is really what it is. <laughs> That's, but, but it, gets, it, it isn't like, I used to try to do that and I, um, would be like hyperventilating, right? Or, or at least my breathing would be super, super heavy. And so I've weaned myself into it. Um, and I have no big goals of running marathons or, you know, I, I just, I think it's a lot on the body. Um, it's one thing if you're, if you weigh 95 pounds with, with the weight I'm at right now, I just don't think that'd be good for my joints. I'm a chiropractor too. So I'm, I'm conscious of how much pressure it puts on joints. Um, but it feels good. And if I drink too much, I'm not doing that. I'm not going out on my walk slash run. I'm, I'm, you know, staying in bed longer. I'm not feeling my best. So I think, like you said, to try to balance, all right, do I want to have a couple drinks and, and then no, what do you call it? Fast forward. Yeah. Yeah. Fast forward into what is that going to mean for me? And am I willing to give up my goals or being on purpose? Like you said, with your life and the work that you're doing, who do I want to, who do I want to show up as? And who is that person? And for me, I've gotten to a place in my life and it certainly sounds like, you know, you're, you're at a similar, slightly different place, but saying, I don't want to be the person that drinks every night and feels like I'm uncomfortable in this relationship with alcohol. I want to be in control of my decisions and make thoughtful decisions of when I choose to include it and when I choose not to. Um, and at the end of the day, that makes me feel stronger and healthier. And um, I'm able to present myself as the Kathy suburb that I want to um, in the world right now. And so that makes me feel good. Um, and the opposite of how I used to feel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, and I feel that um, I think it takes courage. I really do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know about you, but when I started, it was scary because yeah. I'm like, am I going to be boring? Is life not going to be fun? And I'm like, oh my God, there's actually a book called this. We are the lucky ones. And huh. I feel like now that I'm, you know, in it a little deeper, I'm like, oh my gosh, no. I look back to that person, you know, 80 days ago or whatever it was and saying, don't worry. <laughs> so over here, it's so much more fun. And I, and I think it's important to recognize, and one of the members said a few weeks ago on our weekly call, I feel like I've stepped into being brave. I've stepped into courage because yeah, there's a lot of fun and you have a lot of joy. And let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff that comes unearthed that yeah. you must meet and you must welcome and acknowledge and, and move through that. And that's not fun. And I just, you know, there's this, this, there's just so much around this. It's so much, it's, it's not about the alcohol. It's just yeah. not. Mm. Yep. Well, I, oh, I, I, I know, I think we, we could do a whole nother, <laughs> a whole nother podcast on, all right, once you do remove or reduce alcohol, how are you dealing with the things that do pop up? You're like, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, there is that issue that I'm still facing that I need to work through and, and kind of dig into. Um, 
those are hard. Those, those things are hard to go through. But when you're on the other side of them and you have whatever that is for, for you, um, there is that feeling of accomplishment and you're emotionally healthier and you're physically healthier because they just go so hand in hand. Um, so, so anyway, I know, yeah, I know we could just talk for another hour on all of that, but, but Meg, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on to, um, talk about your journey with alcohol, um, for the community that you're building right now with Sober Tranquility, which I just, again, I'm just, I, I, I love the concept and um, the opportunity for someone to plug into what you're doing and have resources that aren't just feeding that you have to have alcohol to have fun. You have to have alcohol to be cool. Um, you know, you have to have alcohol because you work hard and you had a tough day. Um, and again, nothing wrong if someone can manage that relationship with alcohol in a great way um, and include it in their lives on a regular basis without it having any issue. But for many people, it really does, really does cause more issue than, than do good. So, so, so thank you for joining us today. Oh, and it was a pleasure. I, I just look forward to hearing about the rest of your uh, your time up at Tranquility Island. When you said that online, I was like, is it really called Tranquility Island? I'm like, what a coincidence. And then I was like, and then you said that you named it that. So good, good for taking leadership and, and ownership of that. I like that. <laughs> I love it. So I hope you have a wonderful day. And to everyone listening out there, um, if what we've said today is something that triggers something inside of you, or you think, huh, I probably need to give a little, uh, little more thought to this, um, feel free to connect with Meg, connect with myself, or connect with a local um, therapist to chat with all that you have going on and maybe ways that you could release, reduce, or reset alcohol. So I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we will be back with another, another episode next week. Thank you.